An attempt to rival China's Belt and Road Initiative. The EU unveils a major global infrastructure plan. The goal? To invest in developing countries and boost trade links with the rest of the world. But why the interest now? And can the bloc compete with Beijing? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiadeen. It's been described as a roadmap for major investment and infrastructure worldwide. The European Union's global gateway strategy is seen as a challenge to China's Belt and Road Initiative. The plan to raise $340 billion to finance infrastructure. It will focus on transport, health, education and digital and climate projects in Asia, Africa, the Middle East and Latin America. The EU is China's biggest trading partner and the project would allow it to promote its geopolitical influence. Beijing has extended its own reach during the eight years since it launched its own initiative. Well, the Belt and Roads programme was launched in 2013. It's President Xi Jinping's signature project to connect China to the rest of the world. Beijing is investing more than $800 billion in over 13,000 projects in 165 countries. In return, China gets access to the raw materials it needs to fuel its growth. But critics say the initiative has pushed many countries deeply into debt. Well, the European Commission president says the bloc will be a trusted partner and will provide high quality projects. We want to take a different approach. We want to show that a democratic, value driven approach can deliver on the most pressing challenges. We want to show that it can, on one hand, meet no local needs but also, on the other hand, tackle the global challenges we have, and thus, in a way, also, of course, benefit the European Union. Well, let's bring in our guests. Zainab Usman is the director of the Africa program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. In Brussels, we're joined by Luisa Santos, the Deputy Director General at Business Europe. That's a lobbying group representing businesses in Europe. And Victor Gao is the Vice President of the Centre for China and Globalisation. And he joins us from Beijing. A warm welcome to all of you on this edition of Inside Story. Uh, let's start in Europe. Uh, Luisa Santos, what's your reaction to the, the launch of the Global Gateway? What are your initial impressions? Well, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, well, our impression is uh, positive. Uh, we see this as um, a strategic approach from Europe, a new way uh, of relationship with its main trading partners, but also with its neighbors, um, developing countries. Uh, it's also a way of Europe to show that it has a model, uh, an economic model, but also a geopolitical uh, model that is an alternative to others that exist there, including the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's also very important for us because it includes, apart from the public finance and the public sector, an important role for the private sector. I mean, the money that we are talking about will come a lot from companies. So companies need also to believe in these projects. And from our perspective, uh, it is uh, a very good initiative and one that was long overdue. Let's not forget Europe is already the largest donor in the world, the largest investor. What we are doing now is trying to have a more strategic approach, a more Team Europe approach, trying to prioritize different initiatives and putting them under a common umbrella, the Global Gateway. Uh, well, that's the perspective then from Team Europe. Uh, Zainab Usman, uh, what are your thoughts about this proposal? Uh, it seems that from the business community in Europe, it, it seems to be warmly received. How do you think developing nations are likely to view this uh, potential extra source of, 
uh, of investment? So I, I, I think it's a, a generally a welcome initiative that uh, finally uh, the European Union and Europe more broadly is now thinking about infrastructure, investing in public services in developing countries, at least from the perspective of Africa. Because for a long time, this has been a major priority for African countries that they were in need and still are in need of investments in infrastructure and public services uh, to be able to power their economic transformation, to converge with the rest of the world, to be able to diversify their economies, which uh, uh, you know, in Africa, eight, it, it has eight of the world's 15 least diversified economies dependent on oil, gas, minerals, and primary agriculture, and also increase the incomes of people. So this is, this is uh, 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 certainly welcome. But I think there's also a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of African countries are kind of in a wait and see mode because uh, you know, there, are, there are three things that perhaps uh, a lot of people are, are looking out for. Number one, whether this uh, new initiative is going to try to respond to African priorities as defined by Africans themselves around jobs and infrastructure, um, uh, but also around very, very, very recently around COVID-19 vaccines, around pharmaceuticals, you know, the, uh, uh, the European Union and, and many European countries have not supported the initiative at the World Trade Organization to have a temporary uh, IP waiver on, 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 on technology um, uh, around a vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine production, but also around illicit financial flows, which actually drain resources from Africa up to around $90 billion per annum, more than the continent receives in development assistance. And whether, you know, um, this new initiative is going to actually build on the comparative advantage that uh, Europe has around, uh, as you mentioned, pharmaceuticals and vaccines, but also around technology and knowledge transfer. And perhaps the final thing is that a lot of African countries are waiting to see is whether this initiative responds to African priorities in a way that doesn't force Africa to engage in this new Cold War phenomenon that we see playing out in the rest of the world. But do you think the, the, the alternative to, to the initiatives proposed by the, the, the European Union and also by uh, the US, uh, the main alternative would be the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Do you think that responds uh, to African priorities? So what, what has been very interesting with uh, Chinese engagement in Africa um, uh, you know, which kind of accelerated from around the year 2000 uh, and which eventually became subsumed under the Belt and Road Initiative from 2013 is that, you know, the way China has, a, 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 you know, approached this engagement is that they come with an explicit transaction that they want resources, at, at least at the beginning. It was really around obtaining uh, natural resources, oil, minerals, uh, timber, agriculture products to power Af uh, China's own double-digit economic growth at the time, right? So it, it was usually at the time a very explicit transaction that they wanted, or Chinese entities anyways, wanted these resources and in exchange, they were willing to invest in uh, at least some of the priorities that African countries had identified around infrastructure. And I'll give you some uh, striking statistics, you know, which were published uh, just about a week ago before the start of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which just concluded two days ago. So from the year 2000 to 2020, over this 20-year period, China helped African countries build more than 13,000 kilometers of roads and railway, more than 80 large-scale power facilities, funded over 130 medical facilities, et cetera. Right? Et cetera, so but at the is, same uh, time, it's, sorry to jump in there, but at the same time, and, and I don't want to stay on this too long, at the same time, Africa is still getting quite a lot in terms of aid, in terms of trades uh, from Europe and the United States. Uh, so it is, the, the, the figures do cut both ways, but I, I do want to bring in Victor Gao, who, who is joining us from Beijing uh, 
this evening. Uh, Victor, we, we, we've heard that European business is very keen uh, to, 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 to get involved in the, uh, the game of uh, bridging this infrastructure gap. This is something that China has been doing with the Belt and Road Initiative since 2013. Does China welcome this uh, competition, shall we say, or is China somewhat intimidated that they're no longer the, uh, the lender that, that, that countries will go to get to get these big infrastructure projects done? Well, first of all, if the global gateway is truly meant for building up connectivity and infrastructure in developing countries, including African countries, then the more the better. It's not only a it's not a competition. It is very much welcomed, not only by China, but by all the receiving countries. However, if you listen to President uh, Von der Leyen's speech about the global gateway, then you need to worry about it because I hope global gateway is not going to be politicized and used for ideological agenda. And uh, if competition does happen, we all welcome that and we hope it will be competition on equal terms rather than on political agenda or by politicizing such infrastructure and connectivity. We all know African countries in particular suffer from colonialism for several hundred years. And when the British colonists left Africa, infrastructure was in shambles. And many African countries are not connected with each other. And they need to fly to European capitals for transit back to African capitals. So it is a shame. And everyone needs to pitch in to build up connectivity in Africa as well as in other parts of the world. So from the Chinese perspective, we welcome genuine investments in infrastructure and connectivity. Luisa Santos uh, from Business uh, Europe. Uh, we have heard there that, that, well, China welcomes the competition, but uh, is, is wary of the, the, the political undertones of this. Do you see political undertones in the Global Gateway Initiative? No, I think that it's clear that the model is different from the Chinese model. Uh, the global gateway is based on inclusiveness, is based on transparency, is based on reciprocity. Uh, but definitely, uh, maybe these principles are not totally in line with what uh, China wants. But I mean, I think that, and we've always been very clear also as, as, as business, we have already infrastructure in place that was built under the Belt and Road Initiative. I think it doesn't make sense to create uh, parallel initiatives. Uh, when we have already infrastructure there, it makes sense that we create connections. But of course, if we do this, and if we do this under the global gateway with European money, we need to do it with European rules. And I think these European rules based, for instance, on sustainable development, the respect of social rights, the respect of environmental rights, of climate change. Uh, if we do under these conditions, I don't see why we should not cooperate. But it's very clear that uh, these conditions have to be met to make sure that we can cooperate. And let me come back to, to the African question. I mean, Europe, and I repeat, Europe is the largest donor and investor in Africa and around the world. So we're just trying to use a new tool, a new instrument to gather all the resources that are already being invested by Europe, European companies and European governments and try to bring in under a one umbrella with a common objective. And this objective is to be win-win. We don't want this to be only something that serves European industries uh, interests or uh, only European companies. We want also to cooperate with local governments and local business, of course, to okay. make this a, a success. It was quite interesting what you said there, is that uh, uh, Luisa Santos were, were aimed at bringing together uh, existing trade and existing projects. How much of this is going to be new money? The, the headline figure, of course, is 300. Uh, billion euros of investments uh, over the next six years or so. But how much of this is actually new? Well, we have new uh, facilities now, and most of what will be new will be uh, 
money brought by actually the private sector and some of the financial institutions that will be uh, uh, in that will be also associated to 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 the to the initiative and there's also an important component is the idea will be also to bring very a lot of national projects because we have also development banks at national level that are quite important in some countries and the idea is also to bring this together uh, so this is going to be the new part uh, of what we see in terms of resources but I think the, the final financial envelope will depend a lot on also the, the viability of the projects. And if the projects are viable and they make sense from a business point of view, of course, much more money will be gathered from the private sector as well. Zainab Busman, uh, we've heard there that the, 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 the ethos behind the awarding of uh, money for projects and so on will be very much based on uh, Europe's rules on rules of transparency and, and, and so on and so forth. Where's the incentive for, for countries to, to, to plump for the European funding model rather than, say, the, the, the Chinese model, uh, which may not have such stringent requirements? So, so this is this is a very interesting point, and this is why I said uh, I think for a lot of African countries, policymakers and scholars alike, uh, they are in a wait and see mode right now because, um, I mean, uh, my, my colleague uh, Louisa on this panel mentioned that uh, uh, Europe is the uh, largest donor to Africa, which is actually true. Uh, I think the thing, though, is that, um, you know, this is why the, the, the issue of African priorities is quite important because for a, a long time, some African leaders and scholars have been saying that what Africa needs is not just donor funding. It's not just development assistance. That is good and that is needed, particularly in parts of the continent that are in war or in serious, severe crisis. What African countries need is actually meaningful economic engagement. So it is a welcome initiative, this uh, European uh, Global Gateway. And if we can try to make that development assistance that Europe provides even better respond to these priorities around jobs creation, around the provision of infrastructure, then I think that is really, really going to work. And then the final thing I'll mention on this point is that, uh, um, you know, this, this issue of trying to crowd in private investments, working with the private sector, I think, I think a lot of work will have to go into that because traditionally what you find is that the private sector, particularly in Europe, tends to be quite hesitant to engage or invest in Africa because of this perception of risk. So whether this initiative, this Euro European Global Gateway initiative can help de-risk uh, African markets, can help prepare a pipeline of bankable projects uh, for the private sector to invest in, I think that might be a key determinant. So I think a lot of us are kind of in a wait and see mode to see how this is actually going to happen. Um, speaking of risk, uh, Victor Gao in Beijing, over the last, uh, the last uh, eight years or so that the Belt and Road Initiative has been uh, underway, China has taken on a significant level of risk, has it not, with the investments it's made? Uh, does China see that risk as paying off? Because there are countries who have struggled to pay back the, the 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 debts and the sums of money that they have uh, that they've taken on in terms of Chinese finance, does uh, how how does China view that? Thank you very much. I think you are raising a very important question from the Chinese perspective. We have several conclusions. One is that cooperation with African countries should not be just based on donor assistance because that will not really help to build up national capacity in many African countries. Secondly, if you purely use commercial terms and commercial structure, uh, then it will not work because many of the uh, companies will find the investment terms too long, too difficult, profitability uh, too slow, for example, and they probably will not be committed to many of these projects, especially infrastructure projects. So you need to really innovate to come up with uh, model that will suit the circumstances in different African countries, but also to make sure that you really contribute to connectivity 
and infrastructure. Absolutely, and but I'm not just thinking of Africa people. here, Victor Go. I'm also thinking of the, the, the railway projects in Laos, the, uh, the ports in Sri Lanka, uh, where China has uh, had some of those significant debts paid off by 100-year-long leases and uh, the countries selling off the family jewels to, to, in order to service those debts. Does China recognise that its lending practices perhaps need to change somewhat? Well, first of all, loans are always a very important part of the financing package for most of the infrastructure and connectivity projects. So don't single out a loan as if debt itself is evil. If you talk about debt, do you know who borrows most of the money from China? It is not any country in Africa or in Latin America or Asia. It's the United States government. Yes, but Why the United States isn't selling off its coal mines to the Chinese to service that. You need to come up with a viable commercial structure to make sure that the infrastructure projects will be done. Well, let's take that risk and, and, and see how it applies uh, back to the, the Global Gateway Initiative. Uh, Luisa Santos, uh, the, uh, we've highlighted the fact that private companies, certainly in Europe, are going to be a big part of this project. How do you think being under this umbrella is going to incentivize more countries to, to, to start reinvesting, if you like, in developing nations? I think uh, it is important that the part of uh, mitigating risk is important, especially if you want to convince uh, more small and medium-sized companies also to be part of these projects. And we know that in certain regions of the world, and including in Europe, uh, the SMEs are an important uh, partner and an important uh, pillar uh, from an economic point of view. So. The, the project, the Global Gateway, foresees uh, the export credit system. So hopefully there will be uh, a mitigation of the risk. And also the fact that uh, we are, and that is one of the objectives that for business is very important, that we really prioritize projects and that we really look at projects that have a strategic interest in terms of development and economic development. And this way we can canalize the resources for the most viable and most strategic projects. I think this will be uh, ways and tools to, to, mitigate, uh, to mitigate the risk. And, and coming back again to, to, to the importance of having economic development. I think the EU recognizes that development ed is not enough and it's not really leading to sustainable growth. So we need to change the paradigm. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, the EU has come up now with uh, the Global Gateway Strategy. Okay, Zainab Usman, we're almost out of time, so I'll leave the, the last word to you. I, I understand it's very much a wait and see to how this project is going to unfold, but uh, who do you think at this stage is likely to benefit most from the, this new uh, global gateway? So I, I, I think nothing is cast in stone. A lot depends on uh, you know, what approach and how, how, how European countries um, actually um, uh, make, this, make this work on the ground and in reality. Uh, a lot depends on the extent to which uh, this Global Gateway Initiative is actually informed by uh, the, the, the needs and priorities of these developing countries around, in the case of Africa, creating jobs for the 13 to 15 million people joining the labor market every single year, around uh, plugging the infrastructure financing gap of around $100 billion a year, around, and very importantly, um, uh, uh, providing financing for adaptation to climate change to the tune of around $50 billion. Will this respond to these needs set and identified and prioritized by African countries? I think that is very much something uh, that, that will, will, will determine how this goes and the okay. ability of African countries themselves to kind of put their own needs on the agenda. And I'm afraid we are out of time, but thank you to all our guests, Zainab Usman, Luisa Santos, and of course, joining us from Beijing, Victor Gao. And thank you too for watching.
Remember, you can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just head to our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. So from me and the whole team, it's bye for now.